let me just get right into this. Look, here's, here's what I tell uh, God's people. I've been preaching and teaching this for years. I've been a pastor for 33 years in one church. Most of you know I'm down here on the Gulf Coast. Most of you know I spent 10 years in law enforcement prior to that. Um, all of Most of you know that um, uh, that I've written 10 books uh, with two major publishers, and, um, and, and all of them are about the Word of God and prophecy and prophetic connections and all of these things. So I, I said all that to say that what I'm getting ready to say, I'm not pulling out of my back pocket. I have studied and researched. I've been on TV and radio international, national television, preaching conferences and having to defend my positions and think through them and tweak them. And so what I'm going to share with you today comes out of all of that. Now, it doesn't mean that everything I say that I think I'm 100% correct. I try to be humble enough to say, look, I could be wrong about some things, but, but just hear me out and know that when I speak some pretty shocking things, um, I'm not pulling it out of my back pocket. I also want you to know that I am not a date setter, so please don't panic about that. I'm not a hand wringer. I don't run around saying the sky is falling and worrying about, uh, you know, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. No, but listen, I do say some sensational things because the Bible is sensational and, and we are living in sensational and unprecedented times. Uh, but I back it with contextual scriptural connection with scholarly research. And the, and, the, and the writings of other scholars that came long before me, with doing word studies in the Greek and in the Hebrew, connecting correctly those word studies to the Word of God. So with all of that in mind, let me just jump in here and start this. For many years, I have been proclaiming that we are living in the most prophetic times since the first coming of Jesus Christ. We are living in the most profoundly prophetic times since the first coming of Jesus Christ. We are living in the most unprecedentedly prophetic times since the first coming of Jesus Christ. Well, so how can I say that? Well, listen, it all started with the countdown clock of the return of Israel. Now, just bear with me because I'm going to get to COVID-19 and where we are now and what we're living right now to help you to understand that this is profoundly prophetic. It has deeply prophetic connections. But let me start with the return of Israel. All right. That's just 71 years ago. So, so we are in that generation. We're the only generation on the planet for 2,800 years. 2,800 years ago, Israel disappeared as a nation. 2,800 years through that time, there are prophecies throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament of a returned Israel, especially that it would mark the last days, you know, that it would be, it would mark that time of the end, that time just before the Antichrist, just before the return of Jesus. Somewhere in there is the rapture, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I'm not getting into that today. But all of that ties into the last days or the end times. The end times, what does that mean? It means the end of man's wicked rule and reign. It means the end of destruction and death and disease and catastrophe and, and all of the fallenness and lostness of the world. The end of that, the end times, and the beginning of the righteous reign of Jesus Christ. So I look forward to the end times, don't you? And the Bible says, encourage each other with these words. When we speak of the end times and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, encourage each other, long for the day, do all you can to speed its coming. How do we speed the coming of the Lord? I think Matt, Jesus told us in Matthew 24, 14, when he said, look, this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached unto all the nations and then the end will come, the end times. So get out there, preach the gospel, exalt Jesus, sing your praises, even into the darkness, be the salt, be the light. That's what we're here for, because you are actually helping, I guess, to speed the coming of the Lord. The Bible tells us, pray for the coming of the Lord, speed the coming of the Lord, and encourage each other with these words. So it all started, I'm convinced, with the return of the nation of Israel. In fact, if you'll read chapter 37 of Ezekiel, it speaks of a last day's return of Israel. Ezekiel 38 and 39 speaks of that returned Israel then being eventually attacked by a coalition of nations, and it even lists the nations. Some of them are in their ancient tribal names, but they correlate to modern day nations of the world. And we're watching those very nations aligning themselves, Russia, China, Iran, uh, North Korea, Turkey, nations of the Middle East, nations on, on the Horn of Africa and around uh, North Africa. All of those nations that are listed in Ezekiel 38 are all involved, almost all of them are wrapped up in Islam, Almost all of them hate uh, Israel, the returned Israel, um, and or could turn on Israel 
on a dime overnight. Some of them have in the past, and now they're making nice with Israel, but they could instantly turn back. All of those nations are listed. And God says in Ezekiel 38 and 39, he says, and when you see this Israel return and you see these nations uh, forming coalitions together for the purpose ultimately of destroying Israel, then you will know. He says, this is my sign to the nations that Israel has returned. This is my sign to the nation. This, and then you will know that I am God and beside me, there is no other. By the way, these kinds of prophecies that are being fulfilled are only in the Bible. They're only in the word of God. You won't find them anywhere else. The only place where you'll find these exacting specific prophecies that we are living in the midst of is in the Bible. It's in God's word. So the return of Israel 71 years ago, think about it. When Israel returned. People watched it on black and white television, right? There were just three major networks and all the news was days behind. Um, In those 71 little short years, listen, I'm not 71 yet, but but there are many people that are 70 and 80 and 90 years old still alive. That was a part of their early life. They saw it happen. But, But, and there are young people now, I mean, you know, that are under 71, I guess I'd be one of those people, but I'm talking about even teenagers and children. This is all they've ever known is Israel in the Middle East, Israel. It's always been there, right? No, no, it's only been there 71 years, still within our historical generation. So as I speak to you about these things, when I speak of this is the first time in our generation, first time in in this historical generation, for the first time in history, that's what I'm speaking of, these 71 years and beyond, okay? So here we are, Israel has returned, Jerusalem has returned as the lawfully accepted and declared capital of of Israel, another 2,800 year old prophecy, because Jerusalem is the epicenter and the focus and the center of this destruction that is, uh, is planned and plotted against Israel. The scripture's clear about this, Old and New Testament. Um, and Jesus even spoke, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by its enemies, then you'll know the time is nigh. So Jerusalem has a central place. It's connected to a returned Israel. And then we're in the last days. It's what the Bible says. 2,800 years, that prophecy lie dormant. 71 years ago, here it is. Here we are living right in the midst of it. So you have that. Well, in those 71 years, look what's happened. A technological explosion like the planet has never seen. Instantaneous communication information systems, transportation systems on steroids. I can be anywhere in the world I need to be in just a day, a day and a half, anywhere in the world. I can be just a few hours away from thousands of miles of travel, just a few hours. Get on an airplane and I'm there. All of this is spoken of in Daniel chapter 12. It's spoken of throughout the scripture, sometimes in veiled form about communication, taking marks, the whole world seeing something, the whole world knowing something at the same time, a global spirit of Antichrist sweeping the planet. How does that happen? Well, now we know it's happening only in our generation for a global spirit of demonic outpouring and Antichrist and fear and panic, the global spirit instantaneously. I mean, overnight and really quicker than that, it can happen. But uh, we're the first generation to see that. So out of this technological explosion comes the kind of communication we have now. Look what we're doing now, Facebook Live. There's YouTube live stream. All kinds of live stream companies are on the internet. Um, uh, Cell phones, uh, smartphones, connects to the internet, connect, FaceTime, uh, you know, uh, all, I don't want to advertise all these different brand names and companies, but I mean, it's all here, instantaneous communication information where we can see each other, not just hear each other's voices. I mean, this is astounding. And it's all, all that's just happened in the last, oh gosh, 10 years, the stuff I just spoke of, internet technology just in the last 20, 25 years, pervasive internet technology and available ubiquitously around the globe in most people's homes. So we're the first generation to experience that. And along with that has come all sorts of good. The gospel goes around the world, just like Jesus said it would. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the nations. When Jesus spoke that, all the nations hadn't even been discovered or settled. Uh, The technology to take the gospel hadn't been uh, created yet. In fact, when Jesus spoke that, the gospel hadn't been completed yet. He hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't risen from the grave. Yet he was prophesying about our day. And so here we are. 
But on top of the good that's come from technology, the evil, the proliferation of evil and pornography and child abuse and captivity of women and children and sex slave industry and, and, and technology of, you, you know, the genetic editing. And some of that can be for good. Some of it's abject evil, uh, fakery deep fake video, deep fake audio, artificial intelligence. You do know the word artificial means fake, right? Okay. Fake intelligence, robotics. You know, we invent robotics, a lot of good stuff, a lot of cool stuff with robotics. But what are we doing now? We're building killer robots, military robots, um, uh, drone robots, and sex robots. I mean, it just gets filthier and filthier the more we talk about it. That's the world we're living in. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, look, the end's going to be like the days of Noah, as filthy and horrible as it could be until God just pushed the reset button and destroyed it all. He said it's going to be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the days of Lot. Sexual perversion is going to run rampant. Basically, the, the planet won't know what a marriage is or a home or a family or gender or what. They, they won't know anymore. I mean, this is what the Bible speaks of. Um, I'm not disparaging people. I love people and minister to people. I'm not here to get into all of that. I'm, I'm not a name caller. I'm just telling you, the word of God speaks of prophetic elements. We're the first generation to see them come together. Watch this, on a global scale. And a lot of it kind of instantaneously. Um, you see, because all of these things, one way or the other, even without the technology we have now, has existed on the planet ever since the flood, right? I mean, all kinds of evil, pestilence, plagues, epidemics, uh, um, uh, uh, disease, famine, death, dying, murder, destruction, wars. It's been here forever since the garden and since the flood. But what makes our generation so unique and so prophetic and so different is we're the first generation to have the ability to instantaneously communicate and proliferate all of this. And we're the first generation. I'm going to keep going back to this on the other side of the return of Israel. That's huge. That is, that is the marker point. So in the midst of all that, what has happened? Well, in the little 70 years, not only have we had this technological explosion, and listen, I love technology. I'm using it right now. I'm kind of a techno geek, especially to be an old man, but I love it. And um, all the books I write, I use all kinds of technology to get that done and the research. And so I'm not one of those people that says all technology is evil. But think about the evil that is brought. Think about the place to which it has brought us in this world. And so it was through technology that Arab Spring was fan, the flame was fan through technology and social media. Was it not? Of course it was. Well, what did Arab Spring bring? Why is that so bad? Well, it caused a basically reshuffling and reshifting of the Middle East. Here's little Israel, returned Israel, surrounded by enemies, backed up against the Mediterranean Sea. Not the Red Sea, but the Mediterranean Sea. And, and, and it causes the collapse of Syria into an irreconcilable civil war. That, now that word irreconcilable, I didn't make that up. Um, Putin calls it that. Uh, world leaders call it that. The Pope has called it that. Um, I, our, look how long, it's still in the midst of a, of a decay and a downfall. Look what ISIS did. He came sweeping through the air, destroying Christianity, uh, Christian homes and cities and villages and towns and settlements all through the Middle East, gone. 40, 50, 60,000 little orphan children, millions of refugees relocated all over the world. I mean, it's horrific. All of this has just happened in our lifetime. And in America, you know, we, we Starbucks is open, our football games were on TV, our movie stars were performing, so we were fine. You know, the rapture will take care of us. Oh, my gosh. Forgive us, Lord. And now overnight, all those things have been taken from us. Yeah, we hope temporarily, but some people are already having meltdowns because they've done a few weeks without all of those things. We'll talk about that more in a minute because that's tied into the COVID-19 pandemic and prophecy. Okay, we'll get to it in just a moment. But I'm just setting the stage. I'm setting the foundation for, for you to know that, um, yeah, we are living in profoundly prophetic times the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus Christ. The thing that kicked it all off, the thing that marks it, is the return of Israel, of course. And now, with all of these other things happening, I left off talking about Arab Spring, the collapse of Syria, which brought Russia 
into Syria. Now, Russia had a military base there, but now they brought troops. Now they've kind of occupied it. They're trying to prop up the Assad regime and their arms, you know, they trade arms with them in oil. And I mean, this is a big deal to them. So they're fighting ISIS and anybody else that gets in their way. In the meantime, the UN goes crazy or NATO goes crazy and Turkey began by shooting down their planes. But now Turkey and Russia are beginning to make nice, nice. Turkey is falling into an Islamic caliphate. They want to control the whole Middle East with Islam and the world if they're allowed to or if they're able to. They don't care if they allow them or not. They, they're going to try to do it. This is what their president, um, uh, Recep uh, Erdogan, it's, it's, that's what he speaks of. That's his dream. So we're watching all of that, Turkey and Russia, and then China brings its first international military base onto the Horn of Africa in Djibouti. Djibouti, look that up. You'll see a lot of historians and archaeologists identify that as the ancient land of Put, P-U-T. Well, that's in Ezekiel 38, the, the Gog and Magog, which a lot of scholars have believed is somehow Russia or the Stan nations and or Turkey and that whole area. They all come from the same people, uh, Asian, uh, Turkic uh, people. They come from the same tribes. Uh, they're interrelated deeply. Historians, archaeologists, we know this. And so that will be in alignment with Persia. Ezekiel 38 says, well, a Persia is modern day Iran. Until the 1930s, every globe and every map identified what we know as Iran as Persia. So lots happened in the last 70 years. So Russia's in the Middle East and Syria. China is on the horn of Africa supplying troops to Russia and Syria. China and Russia are becoming connected. Russia and Iran, deeply connected since the 1990s, now even further connected. Iran and North Korea are big buddies. North Korea gets a lot of its missile and nuclear technology from Iran, which got it from Russia. <laughs> and there are a lot of people that believe that Russia and China got a lot of its technology from the United States. So here we are We're in the middle of this mess, not even to mention border collapses of major Western civilizations around. Look at Europe. Look at the United States. Millions of people in our nation illegally because of open border policy. We know that many of them have brought disease with them, not all of them, but a lot have. We know that. So we're so concerned about COVID-19. What about, about all the disease that's been brought across the border? Illegal. Drugs, the drug epidemic. Look at all the drugs that pour across the border. Border collapse, border security collapse. Mainstream media tells us, and I've, I have documented this in books I've written. I, I've, I've talked about this profusely. But listen, the media reports that the FBI has attested that they are tracking ISIS cells in all 50 states of the United States, sleeper cells, ready to awaken and to bring America to its knees. We're at a very vulnerable time right now in the middle of this pandemic. Our economic system is closed pretty much or, or, or severely hampered. Our economy is collapsing through the stock market and everything's tied to the stock market. Some of you might say, well, I'm so glad I'm not in the stock market. If you have a retirement account, you're in the stock market of any kind through your job, through your 401k, through any kind of investments, through any kind of any kind of uh, retirement vehicle is invested in the stock market. Yes, you're part of the stock market. It's collapsing. Millions of people are losing and have lost their jobs. Think about it, all the things that America, you know, most people in America, this doesn't apply to me, it probably doesn't apply to a lot of you, but, but most people in America, I mean, they literally worship movie stars and athletes and you know the rock stars. And a lot of people love hanging out in strip joints and dance clubs and juke joints and bars. And they're all gone hopefully just temporarily. Well, I hope some of those are gone forever, but you know what I mean. Hopefully the economy will come back and the engine will begin going again for a little bit for our comfort. But this world is not our home, folks. It's not going to go on forever and ever like the good old days. We've we're living in the midst of seeing how quickly the world can turn on its ear, how quickly the world can turn upside down. Overnight, the whole world can change and buy in to a demonic spirit of fear and panic. But in the midst of all of this, everything that America holds dear, holds its money dear and its wealth and power dear, well, that's collapsing. Lifts up its athletes. There are no sports arenas open. Lifts up its movie stars. Movie theaters are closed. <laughs> Lifts up its rock stars. There's no concerts. All of that's closed. And a lot of Christians who took 
a church on every corner in their neighborhood. Not everywhere in America is like that, but in the Bible Belt it is, and, and in other places. A church on every corner in America? Yeah, 95% of them are closed now. Some of them by government edict. Others by people who just made the decision, pastors and churches. And I'm not disparaging them. Some of them in hot, hot zones, middle of New York City. Can you imagine being in downtown New York with all of this happening? You had a church? I, you might have to shut the doors. But I'm saying some of it happened with panic and fear. And that's between those leaders and those churches. And I'm not judging them. I don't know the dynamics, just like people don't know the dynamics of my church. We haven't shut our doors. We're blessed, though. We live in a very low-risk area, a three-county area down here. 700,000 people. We've had four deaths and just a little more than 200 infections. 700,000 spread out over three counties. Very low risk. Doesn't mean it couldn't change tomorrow. Doesn't mean it couldn't skyrocket. Our governor has issued an order that uh, churches are considered essential services in Florida. Pastors are considered essential personnel, infrastructure personnel. We're allowed to move freely. Allowed, I say. <laughs> we, you know, America. Can you believe we're even using that language? We're allowed to go to church. We're allowed to move freely. Well, these are the days we're living in. But our church is open. And we take all these security measures and safety measures and we spread people apart. We are blessed to have a lot of property. Uh, a big. We've got uh, four or five buildings that are a part of our complex. And so we've got different buildings open with um, uh, video feeds going into them. Um, so we, we can spread people out. And, and we only have the morning worship. We've cut out everything else. No evening worship, no Wednesday worship, no small groups, Sunday schools, Bible studies, food services, children's cramming them in together. Now, all of that is suspended for a while. We have Sunday morning worship, just so people can know the house of God is open and available. The preaching of the word, the singing, the joining in fellowship and singing and praise with belie fellow believers to get up on Sunday mornings, to get dressed, to take a shower, to get cleaned up, to present your best for the Lord, to drive across town, to go into a church. We even have sheriff's office deputies that uh, protect our church as part of our security system. They're out front with the blue lights going, just directing traffic and, you know, protecting us. I, there's nothing in Florida that makes this illegal. Not now, not, not in our area. If they decide to pass a law that we have to shut, more than likely we will temporarily. I, we're not lawbreakers. We're not going to, you know, thumb our nose at the law. But, you know, if it goes on, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they work for the government. They work for Babylon. They obeyed all the laws until it crossed the line. And said, now you can't worship anymore. Now you can't even pray anymore. Daniel, you can't even pray in your home anymore. Well, they were all willing to break the law. Of course, they went to the lion's den. They went to the fiery furnaces. In those cases, the Lord intervened completely and was in the midst of it with them and delivered them as examples of God is able. God is able to deliver you through pestilence, plague, through disease, through viruses, through government persecution. Not only that, but folks, we, we're, we're living out other prophecy. Jesus said, brother will turn against brother, sister against sister for his name's sake. Listen, we've got churches turning in other churches for being open. We've got brothers and sisters in the Lord getting on social media, trashing other Christians, and they don't even know what they're talking about. We have people, listen, I'm going to use us as an example. I'm not whining and crying. It's just that I can speak authoritatively on this, okay? So I'm going to use us as an example. Um, I was a lawman for, for 10 years before I was in the ministry. Two different sheriff's offices under three different sheriffs. It even did criminal investigations uh, through, through the chief criminal investigator in one of the departments. I, I, I'm thoroughly law and order man, but I'm a pastor now too. So the point being, I'm, I'm not some rabid lawbreaker, some rebel looking to overthrow the government. No, I get Romans 13 and all of that, but I also get that the guy that wrote Romans 13 went to prison. He broke the law when it was finally basically said, you can't do what you're doing anymore, Paul. You can't preach the gospel. You can't be building churches all over the Roman empire. So that's the point. So we're living in a safe zone or safe, pretty safe zone over here. Um, we're not we're, we're not immune to the virus or death, but but we're living in an area where we're blessed to be able to keep the church doors open. And, I, and I'm doing that. Not only that, but we live stream to the world. Not only that, but we live stream into these other buildings where people can come on our campus and spread out. Not only that, but in the main sanctuary. Now <laughs> there's plenty of room for everybody to spread out. And because a lot of our people, I tell our people, if you're elderly, stay home. If you're sick, stay home. If you think you're in danger, stay home. 
If you want to come, the doors are open. See, but still, we have brothers and sisters on the internet that don't know any of that. They're calling us murderers and idiots, and they don't know what they're talking about. We're not breaking any law. In fact, our governor, as I said, has issued an order. It is an essential thing for God's people to be able to go to church if they want to. So, but you see, this is what's happened, and it happened overnight. That's the point I'm trying to make here. And we're the first generation to see that be able to happen. We went to bed one night thinking the next day was going to be the same. We woke up to a world that was going crazy with panic and fear. Governments issuing edicts left and right. We were, we were in shock watching it. Some of us thought, well, okay, I see Italy doing that. I see China doing that. I see, you know, I, but America won't do that. And before we could get the words out of our mouth, governor after governor after governor issuing edict and orders, county commissioners, city councilmen, Get to think about it. Now, listen, owning a pawn shop, I'm using this as an example, is a, is a legal business and an admirable business if you run it correctly, admirable if you run it legally. Remember, I was a cop, so I know about pawn shops. But think, so you take somebody that maybe owned a pawn shop, ran for county commissioner or city councilman, won, and now they've got the power to tell me to stay home and that I have to shut my church down. You see the illustration that I'm using? You understand what's happening in America? The First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment shut down overnight, and it's still happening. And even a governor like Florida's governor, who says, no, you can go to church if you want. Oh, he's taking heat. There are, I think, 16 states in the in the nation right now that have similar edicts that, yeah, we, we want people to uh, shelter at home. Uh, please limit it to about 10 people. Uh, keep your hands washed. Practice good hygiene. Don't congregate in big groups, get in each other's faces. If you're sick, stay home. Quarantine yourself. I mean, almost all the governors are saying at least that. But we've got some, 16, that have said, look, you can go to church. We're not going to crush your First Amendment right. Now, you take your life in your own hands, but we're not going to say you can't go to church. And so in some places like ours, it's very, very, it's as safe to come to church here as it is to go to Walmart in our town or Home Depot or, or uh, Lowe's. I'm not trashing these businesses, but a couple of Sunday nights ago, see, we don't have Sunday night services, although I'm going to start doing some Sunday night live streaming. But um, my wife and I, we, we rode, we rode to, the, to Walmart. We were just in the car, just out riding around and just looking at the town. Cars everywhere, people out everywhere, Walmart packed. You couldn't find a parking spot. Uh, Lowe's packed, Home Depot packed. You couldn't find parking spaces. So a lot of people are coming out, fishing poles, golf clubs, azalea plants. Well, they're bored. Well, I, that's fine. They have the right to do that. This is America. But I'm saying a lot of those same people are some of the same brothers and sisters in Christ whose churches are closed for whatever reason. I'm not judging them. But they'll get on social media and trash us because our church was open with 150 people in it, which is way down from what we would normally run, but because people are practicing social isolation on their own, and we don't disparage that. We don't uh, judge them or tease them for it, and we don't uh, uh, shame anybody for it. We say, if you want to come to church, come. But yet, some of the people in our community, in our area, that get on the internet and trash us for having church are going to Walmart buying golf clubs among hundreds and hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people. Then they go over to Lowe's and buy azalea plants, nose to nose, face to face with people. It's amazing. Now, I know some of these big box stores are now, you know, they're changing a little bit and, you know, making a little more socially distancing. But you, you understand what I'm saying. Isn't spiritual nourishment more important than an azalea bush or a new golf club or a new fishing rod? I mean, for a child of God, it should be, right? So the point I'm making is not whether churches are closed or shut and who made those decisions as much as I'm saying, did you ever think that you would ever wake up on a morning when in the United States of America to find a church you could go to on Resurrection Sunday? See, that's the thing. It's coming up. Did you ever think you'd wake up in America and you couldn't find a church to go to on Resurrection Sunday? See, I don't know that that's ever happened in the history of our nation. I don't think it's happened in the history of the planet. Probably a good 90% of the churches around the planet by government edicts are closed. Some of them, it didn't even take a government edict. The churches in the leadership made those decisions. And in some cases, I think it was probably reasonable decisions. But again, I'm not judging anybody, whether it was reasonable or not. It's between you and the Lord. I'm just making the point 
the obvious glaring point that's right in front of us. Churches are closed for the first time in history since the birth of the church. They're closed because of a global spirit of fear. And the Bible's clear. God did not give us that spirit. Well, if God didn't give us that spirit, then Satan did. It's a demonic spirit of fear and panic. But, yet, but rather, God has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Okay? So that's all I'm trying to do with you is just have a reasonable sound mind conversation. So now let's get to COVID-19. Is it prophetically connected? Well, it's got to be. It's got to be. And I'm not saying this is that. I don't know exactly what time we're living in. I'm not a date setter. I just know what's happening in the world. And I've been speaking for years. I wrote a book called Be Thou Prepared about five years ago, just urging people, look, get prepared. Tough times are coming. You don't have to go crazy about it, but be prepared to shelter in place. Oh, I had all kind of people furious with me, telling me I was not a man of faith. Just got to have faith. Well, I get that. But these same people, I bet they lock their doors at night. I bet they wear their seatbelts. I bet they've got fire extinguishers and burglar alarms. Most of them have firearms to protect themselves. Why don't they just buy faith? Just forget all that stuff. Don't lock your door. Don't wear your seatbelt. Don't have a firearm in your house. By the way, don't go to the grocery store. Just buy faith. It'll show up in your front porch, right? Or do you have to prepare? Do you have to go to the grocery store? And when you go, do you buy one day at the time or do you stock up for a week or two? You see, it's ridiculous the way that Christians will judge one another outside of the context of God's word and outside of the context of rationality and reasonableness. And so I'm just trying to get the church to wake up. You do realize that we woke up one morning to a changed world instantly, the whole globe, and we're the first generation to be able to communicate instantly like that, and for some kind of a spirit to sweep the whole globe at once, the Antichrist spirit, the spirit of fear and panic. Never has there been a generation before us that that has happened. And what came with it? Yeah, the closing of movie theaters and sports arenas and civic centers and big malls and all those things we love to do, the crashing of the stock market, the losing of jobs, but also the shutting down of the churches, which leads me to a passage I've spoken of. I wrote about it in a brand new book. Again, I, this is not a book advertisement, but this is just released and it was released before the COVID outbreak was really big. And I wrote it long before we even heard of COVID. It's called Masquerade. And it talks about the days that we're living in and the days that are ahead of us and the lies and the deceits and the lying wonders and the masquerade that is afoot. And we're now living in the midst of it. And I want you to think that in the midst of all of this, and churches coming towards Resurrection Sunday, the unavailability, oh, you can go online, maybe. You know, I mean, the internet can be shut down or it can have a bandwidth problem and that's happened already, glitches all over the nation on Sundays and, oh my goodness. And there are other ways people can get around it, but the point is you're hard pressed to find a house of the Lord where you can go and congregate and worship and sing together and gather around the word together, coming up to Resurrection Sunday. It happened overnight. How can that not be prophetic? It leads me to a couple of passages to think about, a couple of biblical truths. One of them that I wrote about in Masquerade, and, and Masquerade's not only about this, but I spend several chapters writing about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is a truth that makes people mad to hear but I can't help that. I know what the context is. And it goes, and, and my understanding of this goes all the way back to the first century. This understanding that I'm going to give you was the prevalent understanding for the first 1900 years of Christian scholarship. And that is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where it speaks of the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, throwing truth to the ground, the deception, the, the, the lawlessness that will sweep the planet. Look at us now. First Amendment gone, Second Amendment gone, Fourth Amendment gone. Lawlessness, I mean, constitutions being overturned, people's rights being snatched out from underneath them under threat of Gestapo-like tactics put people in their homes, imprison them while we let convicts out of prison, some of them serial sex offenders, according to headline news reports. I, 
lawlessness. Second Thessalonians chapter two speaks of that. And he says, and this man of lawlessness will set himself up in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, folks, listen to me. That could ultimately manifest itself in the last days of a new temple built on the Temple Mount, the third temple, the Antichrist sitting there issuing edicts. It could be that. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is not that. There may be other scriptures you can point to, but not 2 Thessalonians 2. Why? Because who wrote it? Paul did. The phrase he used is specific, and it uses a specific Greek word. The temple of God sets himself up in the temple of God and says, he is God. We have to obey him regarding what we do in the temple. Well, who you, who wrote that? Paul. He also, when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica, he said, you don't, you shouldn't even need me to tell you this. I've written to this before. I've preached to this before. Well, we have his writings. <laughs> we know what he said about the temple of God over and over. He says, don't you know you are the temple of God? Don't you know the church is the temple of God? Don't you know the temple of God is Jews in Christ, Gentiles in Christ, the two become coming together to be one man in Jesus Christ, raising up a new and holy temple unto the Lord. You are the temple of God. You are the temple of God. The word in Greek is naos, the inner place, the holy place. You are the holy place of God. Your reasonable act of worship and sacrifice. See, in Daniel, it talks about that this beast will cause the sacrifices to cease. Well, that's in the last days. So we got to be talking about New Testament times. So what are the sacrifices according to the New Testament? In New Testament times, people say, oh, he's talking to the Jews. No, he wasn't. Daniel was talking about the last days and the bursting forth of the gospel, the birth of the church. I, what's the sacrifice? Paul tells us, Romans chapter 12, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins are committed outside the body, but this is inside the body. And don't you know that your body is the temple of God, where the Holy Spirit dwells? Flee from that. I, folks, when 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about lawlessness, deceit, lying, fakery, truth being thrown to the ground, and on top of all of this, this Antichrist spirit and the Antichrist himself will set himself up amidst or in the temple of God and proclaim himself to be God. Folks, we are right now living in at least a foreshadowing of that. Governments all over the world, local governments, city councils, county commission, governors, federal governments, national governments, shut down the church. We know better than you. We are your God. Shut down the church or we will lock you away. We will put you in prison. We will find you. We will seize your assets, some governments are saying. Doesn't that sound like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in the context in which Paul used it? Well, I'm not here to force a particular doctrine down your throat. I'm just telling you, I know what the Word of God says. I know the connections. I know the biblical languages. I know what the scholars said for the last 1900 years about the interpretation of that passage. Only that passage is all I'm dealing with. And the reason is because we're living it. I'm watching it happen. It's all in my book, Masquerade, and I had no idea this was going to happen so quickly. That's why I wrote Be Thou Prepared, because I knew it was coming. I wrote Masquerade because I could feel it in my bones. It was coming. I had no idea it would happen so quickly. Right at the release of my book, it happens. And it happens overnight. So yes, it's prophetic. We've always had diseases. We've always had viruses. We've always had pandemics, starving, uh, you know, famine, you know, earthquakes and volcanoes and fires and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and disaster and death. That will be until Jesus comes again and makes everything new. But in the meantime, we're living in a fallen world, but we are living in a specific generation, an unprecedented generation. 71 years, the other side of the return of Israel and Jerusalem in the midst of a technological explosion, and now in the midst of an antichrist spirit where the government becomes God overnight. Obviously truncated national governments or city and local and county governments, but the government, the government becomes God overnight and actually tells the church on Resurrection Sunday, you can't worship. How can that not be prophetic? Resurrection Sunday? You see, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that was the death nail of Satan. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the whole world is about. It's what, the whole, it's what all of life is about. It's what 
the whole Old Testament was building to, the whole New Testament testifies of. The book of Revelation ends with the resurrected Jesus. I'm the one that was dead and now am living and alive forevermore. I mean, mean, it's about the resurrection and Satan knows that's his death nail. Revelation chapter 12 gives this whole panoramic from the Garden of Eden and, 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 the, and, and the, the, uh, the pronouncement of death coming upon Satan through the womb of a woman and the seed that comes. And so when the woman gives birth, and that could be a picture of Eve, but in the whole context, it's really a picture of Israel that gives birth to the word of God, gives birth to the prophecies of the Christ, eventually gives birth to the Christ, which gives birth to the Holy Spirit among God's people, which gives birth to the church, which gives birth to the gospel. Satan knows it. And it was the resurrection that did it. If Jesus had walked this earth and said a bunch of religious things, even performed some miracles, went to the cross and died, and his body rotted in the grave, nothing he said or did would have mattered. Because he promised us, I will prove to you that I'm the Lord of life. I'm not just some religious leader or some gifted man from God. I am God with you. I am God in the flesh. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am Yeshua HaMashiach, Hebrew for Jesus the Messiah. Salvation from God, which is your Messiah. He said, I will rise from the dead after three days, which by the way, there are prophecies in the Old Testament that speak of that. So he had to fulfill that and he did. And the calendars of the world were changed to mark it. And Satan knows it. Don't you find it interesting that 71 years after the return of Israel, in the midst of these profoundly prophetic times, overnight a virus, what do you speak about computer viruses? A virus changes the world and shuts down the churches. And here we are, Resurrection Sunday. Remember when President Donald Trump a few weeks ago said, look, by Resurrection Sunday, we'll be up and running. The world went crazy. The left went crazy. The God haters went crazy. The people all over the world said, you're an idiot. You can't say that. You can't say that. No, it'll be long after uh, Easter, they call it. You know, it'll be. And look, here we are, Resurrection Sunday. And there's no let up. It's worse than ever the first time in the history of the planet that the church universal all over the globe, by and large, there are exceptions. My church is one of them, but universally shut down on Resurrection Sunday. Oh, I think we're getting close. I don't know when, I don't set dates. I've told you that, but listen, I use this illustration. If the end of times, if the last days is represented by a large room People say, where are we? Well, I don't set dates, but I know this. I believe this. We've stepped over the threshold, through the door. We're now in the room. And if the far wall represents the Antichrist short reign for six or seven, eight years, whatever, people say seven years because of certain scriptures, and I'll, I'll say that, seven years, and, and, and then the return of the Lord, and somewhere in there is the rapture, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. But, but if the far wall represents all that, that short little time, in relation to all of it. It's a short little time. I don't know how far we are from that far wall, but we're in the room. We're in the room of the last days. There's no doubt. For people that are listening to me right now and thinking about what I'm saying and understanding like, oh yeah, churches are shut for the first time in American history, for the first time in world history, all over the world. Happened overnight. It was able to happen overnight because of technology, the ability to communicate instantly, and the ability to spread panic and fear everywhere. Some of it's warranted if you're in a hot spot. A lot of it's not warranted, but it's all over the globe. And Israel's return, Jerusalem's return. The Middle East has basically reshifted. Syria's in an irreconcilable civil war. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Muslim nations, all in alignment. Most of them have their sights set on Israel, just like the word of God said. And the largest Christian nation on the planet, America, has been brought to its knees. And a lot of its people have run and hidden and said, we have to obey the government. We have to obey the government. Well, yeah, we, we do. Like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Romans 13, Paul. You know, I, I get that. But Paul went to prison breaking the law because they stepped over the line. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the lion's den and to the fiery furnaces because the government stepped over the line. And they finally said, we must serve God rather than man. I am not, our church is not at that point yet. And I don't know that America is. And I'm not calling for some revolution against the government. I am not, not yet. (laughs) But I'm saying the world is listening like never before. 
the world has their radar up. We have their attention like never before. And so we have to redeem these times. God knows what he's doing. He's on his throne. He, you know, none of this has taken him by surprise. So what do we do? I tell Christians, look, mow the grass, pay the bills, educate the children, save for the future. We don't know the day or the hour. We got to get on with life. We got to do life. We're only here 60, 70, 80 years if we're blessed, 90 if we're really blessed. And that's it. Then we report back to the Lord. This world is not our home. We are ambassadors for the kingdom of Jesus, right? Isn't that what the word of God tells us? God's working everything for good for those that love him and know him and are called according to his purpose, right? Isn't that what the word of God says? I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Neither angels nor demons, depths or powers or heights. Or, okay, right? That's all in the Bible. Romans 8. God has not given us a spirit of fear, not if you belong to the Lord, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Our God is able to deliver. He's able to protect. He's able to shield us. Jesus said, like the days of Noah. Peter says, Second Peter chapter 2, I think it is, where he says, look, he did, God knew how to take care of the, Noah and his family in, in those days. He knew how to take care of Lot and those people in his days. God knows how to take care of us in our days and in the last days to come. I just want you to know that. Just relax. Take a breath. Enjoy life. Enjoy your family. If life does kind of get back into the routine, don't let it become routinized in your life. Um, immerse yourself back in God's house. Immerse yourself back in the, in the ministry of God's people and missions and ministry and outreach, sharing the gospel. You can do that now. You don't need a building to do that, certainly. But having a place to go, even if it's outside in a tent, having a place where you can congregate and worship and shake hands and hug necks and worship together and sing and praise, I mean, that's huge. That's why Hebrews 10 tells us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are inaccustomed to doing, especially as you see the, the day, and those words are capitalized, approaching. It was written to the last days. So there's going to be a great temptation in the last days not to assemble yourself. But the word of God, not, not Carl Gallup's, the word of God says, do not forsake that especially as it gets closer and closer to the end. So we have a lot of choices to make, tough choices. I may have to shut my church if the governor orders it. If this becomes a hot spot over here, uh, it'll be temporarily, I promise. I mean, we're, we're, we'll obey the government. We're not lawbreakers. But on the other hand, I'm not going to let it go on and on and on and on and on and on indefinitely either. We'll do something else. We, we'll make contingency plans. But I'm telling you, thank you for letting me do this. And uh, for those of you that saw the first one, you know this is a redo. We're not going to mess with the editing of this one, I promise you. But thank you for letting me share these words with you, giving you some perspective. Is COVID-19 tied to prophecy? It has to be, not because of the virus itself, but because of the world's reaction to it and because of the church's reaction to it and God's people's reaction to each other to it. All kind of prophecies being fulfilled right before us. The spirit of Antichrist sweeping the world, the spirit of fear and panic sweeping the world overnight. And we're still living in the midst of it as I am streaming this live Facebook teaching. We don't know where it's going from here. How can it not be prophetic? And here comes Resurrection Sunday. And most of you listening to this don't have a church to go to. Oh, you can go online. I get that. I pray you can. If you can't, join ours, hickorhammockbaptist.org. We stream our services live. Plus, I do teachings like this from now on, on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. You can join us at Hickerhammock, uh Baptist org, or at our and from there you can click the Facebook icon and go right to it, or you can just go straight to our Facebook. Um, I don't even remember the address. I just click on the icon, so I'm sorry. But go to that. If you can't remember any of that, just remember my name, Carl Gallops dot com. Okay, and from there you can click on the menu bar and it says the church. Click on it, take you to the church. From there you can click the Facebook. You'll see it all. It's all, it'll all be right there. And so in the meantime, may the Lord bless you and keep you always. I pray for you. You pray for me. We're living in odd times, right? No, we're living in prophetic times. The days and the kind of days and the leading up to the days that the word of God and Jesus himself told us would come. Now it's time we take this seriously. It's time we take the word of God seriously and our walk with the Lord seriously. And it's time the church quits butchering each other. We need to stand united around the gospel of Jesus Christ, the crucified resurrected and glorified Savior and soon coming King of Kings. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you again soon.